Hi, Lior. Welcome to Venture with Grace today. Great to be here, Grace. Thanks for having me. Um, to start the show, I wanted to say I think you have um, such an interesting background. You are working for the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like it's a yeah. really special force. Can you tell us more about that experience? On um, you know what were things early on in your life that kind of shaped into who you are today? Yeah, I was. When you say interesting background, I looked back and I looked at my background of uh, of my girls. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw that too. I was, that like, I, was not, I was not sure which background you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I, I started my career. I'm from Israel originally. I started my career like everyone else in the military, and I went to the special forces for a bunch of years, and uh, definitely uh, was transformative uh, to to my life uh, and also to my career because there is just a lot of similarity between special forces and building companies and startups. Uh, and entrepreneurship. So definitely got my first laps in the military. What is what is it like to work for special force? It sounds like it's kind of like the CIA or not CIA, but like what is a special um, team called? But anyway, so it sounds like a mm -hmm. special like like what do you what kind of qualification do you need to even join something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, probably similar more here to the Navy SEALs than uh, the CIA. Um, so Okay. Um, you need you need to have um, both the physical and the mental uh, ability to go through quite a lot. Uh, you work in a small teams. Uh, you um, um, do things that are uh, very extreme, um, mm -hmm. and naturally, it's required the ability to have a, a fairly strong uh, mental and physical uh, background. And uh, it's there is a lot of similarity actually of building a startup uh, when you're thinking about it. So maybe I. Uh, start building startups in the age of 18 uh, as they join the military. Mm, what What do you th think is like one of the similarities or differences? You know, it's kind of like uh, you play against the odds. It's like uh, it's a very small teams, uh, very high function, uh, works uh, with very, very strong bond. Um, and you do things that are crazy. Um, and I think I find that uh, that uh, energy and that uh, drawn offense is something that I find very similar when building companies today. Um, think about it, you get with a bunch of folks to do things that sounds really crazy and really big and you kind of willing to uh, go to war for each of your team members. Um, and kind of watch their back and uh, I find that uh, the energy um and the personality that it's required uh, actually there is a lot of similarity mm. and then later on you got hired by um like i i'm gonna butcher the name alimentum yeah. like so you got hired by this team to um becoming the person who is like chatting with um or sells uh sells the services to um, Fortune 500 CIOs or like, you know, C-level executives. Tell us more about those lessons that you've learned early on that kind of like help you shape you into a great investor later on. Yeah, so um, after after the military, I did a company with my young brother called Intucel that Cisco bought and they moved me here to the Bay Area and I met the CEO of Flextronics, Mike McNamara, and he asked me to come and build for him the digital transformation team. Uh, and the first project that I worked on was Elementum. And basically we built the supply chain visibility tool originally internally at Flex, and then we spin out that team uh, to providing uh, the ability to look on your supply chain in an holistic way uh, and leverage the Flextronics network in order to go and push it to both the customers as well, their partners. And, you know, same, we were like uh, six people uh, based in Palo Alto uh, that got the Flextronics uh, um, big military behind you and we need to run really fast in front of that uh, big troops and, uh, and have the ability to go and partner with Flex customers and show them how we can help their supply chain to streamline through that uh, piece of software. It was a uh, really interesting and uh, an amazing experience. Mm, I wonder, okay, so I want to talk about your investing experience. You know, not everybody can run a billion dollar fund. What's the thinking framework on taking the sector to invest in? And how does the game work? And when you're playing in like the billion dollar fund category of funds? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, so um, I, I was at Flex for three and a half years um, working with Mike uh, 
uh, building that uh, digital transformation team, focusing on building uh, teams that can innovate in our manufacturing, supply chain, logistics. And I lived in the Bay Area and all of my friends was all about enterprise software, SaaS, fintech, although I'm super passionate about physical industries and go and digital transform them as my day job at Flex. And, you know, just zooming out and looking on those industries, they are combining around 85 to 90% of the world GDP. So the majority of actually the economy of the world is those physical industries. And they did not have the same um, tech transformation that we are also familiar from the world of traditional software. And I decided just to leave Flex and go and start Eclipse because I felt we're going to see a lot of Teslas and a lot of NVIDIAs that actually building tough companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they have hardware, they have semiconductor, they have robotic systems. It's, it's actually the full stack that I historically was talking a lot about. And I just felt like the future of the world is going to be um, those companies that are going and transforming those industries, everything from mining to construction to manufacturing. Uh, answering your question, my first idea was not to start a billion dollar fund. Mm -hmm. I actually started with a $125 million uh, fund in 2015. Because in 2015, it was just very hard to convince uh, limited partners why those very uh, old line industries are going to change by technology. Uh, I, it got much easier in the last uh, couple of years as we are seeing more success in the public market and also as we are seeing more of the geopolitics issues, uh, deglobalization, onshoring manufacturing, naturally the semiconductor boom to support AI is just uh, continued to raise. Um, so yeah, definitely you need, you need capital in order to do what we do. Um, why is most investor focusing on SaaS related things and nobody want to touch what you do? It's Not so nobody, I, I, like there's a few yeah. really amazing players in the industry. I want to yeah. correct whatever I said. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, um, the, the person I actually start Eclipse with is this guy named Pierre Lamond. Uh, I was uh, 29 years old and he was 85 when we started the film. Um, he actually started his career at National Semiconductor uh, for Golden Moore. And then he did, uh, uh, he started his career at uh, Fairchild and then he did National Semiconductor and his VP sales was Don Valentine and they left to start Sequoia. And actually they invested mainly in the companies I'm investing today because mm -hmm. this is where they came from. They came from an operating background in those industries. So it was very natural for them to invest in those companies. I think my generation and the reason that most of my friends are investing in SaaS and, and, and enterprise software and FinTech is because this is what, what was the lead uh, market in Silicon Valley in the last 20 years, right? It was the Facebook phenomena. Um, everyone uh, was, young folks uh, wearing hoodies that uh, wants to do software companies. Um, and I think that's kind of where the return was. And this is the background of, of my generation. I think now as the world is going into a new phase of industrial evolution, I think we are seeing more and more people understanding that the real big companies uh, that are going to become trillions of dollars, the Amazon, the Nvidia uh, uh, of the world, we just talked about the uh, Tesla and SpaceX are going to be built in physical industries. And I think more and more people are going to follow what we do. Mm. As a small check and joint investor, like small check writer, I invest in one robotic companies. All my friends are giving shit to me. Like basically people are like, this is a hardware company. It's going to be capital intensive. You will have a hard time to make money from this, blah, blah, blah. So what's your comeback to these people? So I would say that um, my argue, uh, first of all, I think, you know, what those people are telling you, it's kind of was what was the mindset in the last 20 years of anything that is not pure software. Um, I think if you're looking on the public market and you're looking on the top 20 companies, the majority of them actually building hardware as well, uh, because the differentiation when you're doing a full stack company is way more significant when you're doing a pure software company. Uh, the other thing that happened is I can use today open source uh, uh, software. I can use today cloud infrastructure, connectivity. I can use contract manufacturing. And actually the cost of starting those companies went down in a factor of 10 in the last 10 years. So actually you need much less capital in order to start those companies. 
Now, if you are successful, you are going to raise a lot of money. But that argues true to any fintech and SaaS company as well. It's actually not different. If you are successful, you're, you're usually going to raise a lot of money. But uh, I think as we are seeing more companies like SpaceX being built and others, I think um, the appetite of uh, young uh, smart founders to solve tough problems that might involve also hardware or battery or semiconductor is growing. Uh, and I think the cost of doing, doing those companies is continue to go down. So the opportunity will just grow. Mm. I wonder how does the hardware industry work? Like where is the money coming from? Is that from the government or like is, I mean, like the bigger amount of money, like who are the buyers? Like, um, yeah. How does the money work in this entire sector? Yeah, I mean, um, we definitely spending a lot of time um, with the government. When you're thinking about the current administration, they have a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill to rebuild uh, the manufacturing uh, um, industry in this country. So the government is going to continue to spend more money as the world is going into a deglobalization. And governments, uh, with all of the respects to the worlds of fintech and SaaS, this is not the top of mind for governments. Top of mind for government for government is energy, defense, manufacturing, industrial, healthcare. And regardless if you live in this country or in other countries, governments are going to continue accelerate the spend in those markets as the world is just moving from globalization to deglobalization. Um, but yeah, I mean. There is companies that probably you never heard about uh, called ASML that their market cap is $250 billion doing one piece of a semiconductor uh, uh, called lithography. There's a company called KLA worth uh, uh, $80 billion. They're doing one piece of semiconductor testing. There's a company used to call PCC uh, doing metal manufacturing that Brickshell bought in $38 billion. So actually, there is much more capital in those sectors is just uh, outside usually of what Silicon Valley is talking about every day. Mm. So you invest in very diverse set of companies. Um, you know, there's baby care, there is pet related things, and there is um, propulsion companies. So like, what do they have in common? And what's your investing strategy in this space? Like, where do you think are going to be the most amount of innovation are going to come from? The, the, co the commonality in all of those companies, they all innovate in a full stack. They all vertically integrate uh, in order to create a digital transformation in those industries. And regardless if it's a consumer health, uh, uh, medical or space, um, each of our companies are looking on the overall problem. All of those industries are huge and they're asking themselves, what is the most compelling stack that we need to create in order to digital transform this industry? Uh, if we need to own the warehouse, we'll own the warehouse. If we need to manufacturing something, we will manufacturing something. If we need to uh, build hardware, we'll build hardware. Um, we are looking for people that don't have fear to really look on what is the largest company you can build and this physical industry and we will go and partner with you both with our operating experience as well with our capital to allow you to take a long-term view of how potentially you, you can create a tesla or an nvidia type of an outcome mm. how do you find these founders i hear from this other podcast you know some of them are second time, like so you recently backed second time founders which are you know successful portfolio company founders but before you pick them like how do you filter out these people yeah it's um um it's slightly different type of founders the people that we work with it's not a drop off from stanford uh, in the age of 20. it's usually people actually in their late 30s mid 40s that came from those type of companies from the nvidia from the apple uh for this from the samsara from the spacex and they're being the great operators and they learn how to innovate at uh, way more doing self-driving cars and now they are taking that knowledge in order to build a company in self-driving machinery for heavy machinery so maybe it's a first time founders but they're not first time uh, um, operators and then the magnitude of these people and their ability to attract talent and the ability to build things that are uh, amazing is is just super exciting 
And mm. we, we see in, any, in every year more than 3,000 of them. So we're fortunate to actually see a lot of those amazing people. We, our model, we only lead and we do, um, we all, we, when we lead something, we go all in. So unfortunately, we cannot do 3,000 companies every year. Um, but I will say that the volume of those companies that is being built is one graph and is up to the right. Mm. Can you talk about using any of your company as example from how you source them to how you pick them versus their competitors to winning the deal to maybe eventually liquidate? But um, we don't have to talk about the liquidation part if it's still in a portfolio. Yeah, I, I will actually start maybe with the liquidation, uh, liquidity part. Uh, um, we do not think about um, when we can sell a company. We think only how we can build enduring business, a company that will transform an industry. And I did a red eye yesterday to Boston to spend the time uh, with one of our companies. It's a company called Vulcan Forms, and they're uh, using high-speed lasers in order to manufacturing high-end metal, metal parts. Metal parts, it's a $3 trillion industry globally. It's a $1 trillion in the U.S. with T. Um, and it's been used traditionally, CNC stamping and traditional methodology of manufacturing metals kind of didn't really change in the last 50 years from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and what Vulcan is doing is uh, basically they are building this extremely very large machines, looks like a semiconductor machine, that combining a lot of fiber laser in order to basically streamline laser waves in order to form uh, those metal parts, especially for medical devices and orthopedics, aerospace and defense and automotive. Um, we met that guy, uh, this guy, Martin Feldman, um, that went to his PhD at MIT with Professor John Hartz that's teaching um, uh, manufacturing and the dean of manufacturing in MIT. Martin works for Mercedes before on the uh, next generation uh, metal manufacturing. And when we met them, uh, and they were telling us of, uh, you know, two guys, six slides, telling us they're going to transform how people are manufacturing metals. Uh, we just believe in them. And we were leading each of their rounds for four different rounds to have the ability um, six years later to go to a factory in Boston today uh, that have billions of dollars of backlogs to manufacturing those metal parts. Um, so it's just super exciting. And I actually don't think about the exits of this company. I think about like how we can eat more of that $1 trillion uh, time in the United States and just own that metal manufacturing. I guess, how do you find the LPs that's aligning with your vision? Because, you know, I feel like liquidating or exit is very important for many people and people are getting more impatient on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, I blame TikTok for that, but anyway, so what's your thought on finding the people with the alignment with you? You know, uh, Grace, what I learned, when you build enduring companies, usually they will have the higher chance to be a great exit. Uh, but I don't think about the exit. I think about the quality of the company. But, you know, we sold multiple of companies in the last couple of years. We took multiple of companies public. We are about to take one more. Um, so I think if you solve really tough problem and you build an amazing business, good things will happen also on the exit. Uh, but to answer your question, we actually have a fairly small LP base, less than 35 names, um, all US based, all um, um, nonprofit organization. The majority of them is university endowments, but we have some bunch of foundations, pensions and hospital systems um, that we are very fortunate to um, be able to work with them in the last nine years, um, knowing that our success and our alpha creation also doing good for the world because those organizations can pay for tuition, can invest more in research, can give grants to their foundation. Um, but we are a mission-based LPs and we're raising money from nonprofit organizations. Um, I think what they found of what we do uh, unique is they did the same act that we did. The majority of the world GDP is in those physical industries. And I think you and I will agree that in the next couple of decades, technology will become bigger parts of those industries. So to the people that can find those companies, invest and build them, they're going to have very strong returns. I wonder 
I want to switch gear a little bit. You talk about you join the fund or like you join the funding funding partner of the fund uh, at age 29. Um, what were your track record then that or like what what do people see in you to, you know, build like an enduring fund with you? It's a really good question that I'm still asking because I did not uh, ask myself, I did not have any track record. I never invested dime uh, before starting Eclipse. I'm an operator. Uh, yes, I built a company that Cisco bought for almost a half a billion dollars. And yes, I built a bunch of companies while I was at Flextonics that were successful. Uh, but investing, it's I never uh, thought about myself as an investor. I still don't think about myself as an investor. I'm, I'm an operator with capital. And I'm bringing my operating chops and my partners operating chops with our capital to help build companies in the intersection between technology and physical world. Um, you will need to ask those LPs what they were seeing, but uh, it was not a, a glory uh, performance of investing a career before. You explain it in one sentence. You sold a company to Cisco for half billion dollars. Can you unpack <laughs> that? How to sell a company to another company for half billion dollars to be accurate it was 475 million not uh, half a billion uh, but yes uh, after the military my young brother come uh, with an idea with two guys how to move traffic between cell towers for edge devices and kind of we build a company called into cell uh, that did it for companies like at&t uh, cisco thought that it's very strategic for them uh, for their small cell business and uh, they acquired us in 2012 uh for 475 million um how do you took an idea that sounds like pretty vague and sounds like you also didn't really have experience in that industry to a successful company i guess like can you break it down for like maybe three parts one is like the product part like how do you build it and then two is like how do you sell it to clients or like um you know acquire market share and the third part is like how do you Essentially, being efficiently so sounds like a, it's a really fairly short journey for like three years or something. Like you guys kind of like built this successfully. So I wonder how do you, yeah, like teach us how to build a yeah. four hundred something million dollar company. Yeah, it's 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 always boiled down for me for three things. That's what I look for when I build new companies. Now you need to have differentiated strategy. I, I'm personally not good on building something that there is 20 of them already and I'm going to be the 21 with some changes. I always look on crazy differentiated strategy. You need to have a team that is uniquely qualified on that strategy. Um, I, I, if you will tell me, hey, go build a fintech company or ensure it's not who I am, it will not be authentic to, to me. And the third one, you need to get lucky. Uh, so let's unpack to the, the Intucell story. We had a strategy that the network is going to have more and more and more demand because of edge devices. Um, we are connecting more things to the internet like IoTs and mobile phone, and that's putting more overload on each of those cell towers um, that the mobile carriers are putting out. And they don't have enough money and they don't have the regulation to add more spectrums in order to roll out more equipment. So our strategy was like how from an existing infrastructure, we can squeeze more. Um, the, uh, the second thing, uh, uniquely qualified, um, my young brother and his two friends uh, went into intelligence units that they teach them how to uh, deal with RF and the ability to influence of the mobile network for originally military use cases, but they took the same idea and say what we can do it in, in the commercial world. And the third one, getting lucky, is AT&T AT &T just really uh, fall in love in what we were doing and give us a very strategic contract. And AT&T is one of the most important customers of Cisco. So when we got that contract, Cisco raised their hand and say, we need to own that assets in order to build the overall relationship with AT&T. Was it a problem that only Israel have? Or like was this like a global yeah. thing that could just be executed everywhere? No, actually, Israel don't have that problem. There's not enough uh, uh, people and devices in Israel to have that problem. It's actually a problem usually of, of a big market like US, Asia, markets where there is a lot of devices that growing very fast on the network. So your brother and 
his friends were solving a problem that's globally but like i yes. i'm so amazed by um you know founders from israel because i feel like they're always solving the global problems yesterday i was uh chatting with a friend she told me uh israel actually creating like you know uh the israel founder created company are like four times more profitable or like more like bigger scale than like us based founders i was in shock but um i wasn't really in shock because i feel like i've heard about like amazing stories from like several founders but i wonder how do you even understand the problem from like a global perspective and like what was the what was the sales journey like to kind of execute on um, this idea when you were assuming you guys were based in the israel yeah so um, one thing that we have in Israel, we, uh, we have uh, human capital. It's actually the only thing that we have. We have just people that uh, um, are hard workers, smart, that very creative uh, because the, the history of the country. And we are all going into the militaries and getting skills that are very relevant um, to building companies in a very young age. Um, what we don't have, we don't have a bunch of things, but uh, one of those things is there is never a market. Israel is a small country, so the market is not exist. So you always building the company with the mindsets of global because there is no local, there is no domestic market, right? Uh, it's a 10 million people uh, after all. Um, and that constraint is also one of the opportunities because you immediately in a very early stage company think very big and very global because you must do. And you must think internationally, not domestically. Um, Full credit to my young brother and the other two guys that were able to get at t to give us a pilot uh, to begin with, showing them on the demo network that the solution is actually working superly. And through that, actually uh, getting the multi-year contract to expand into multiple of geographies of at t in US. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when you build a company in Israel, you know that you're going to spend at least uh, 50, 60% of your time on planes because the market is not there. How do you get a contract from at t if you are, you know, three persons sitting in Israel trying to build a company in the space? Who do you call at t that they will pick up and how do you kind of navigate the sales process? Yeah, in their case, it was we got into another Israeli guy that uh, live in the US as part and work for at t that works part of their at t labs. And through the labs, we went into the CTO office and kind of got into the commercial yeah, but you know, this is a two year sales cycle, 18 to 24 month sales cycle, enterprise sales. You start finding your in uh, of one of those organization. They never go into a big deal out of the gate with a small company. It will always start with like a pilot POC or something like that. You need to demonstrate for them the return of investment. You need to uh, demonstrate for them that your systems are actually scalable and also safe. They don't want, you know, they cannot afford to have the network fall because of uh, one small company. And then they usually will expand with you. Um, but yeah, enterprise sale, it's, um, it's, it's uh, the only thing I, uh, I work on today because all of our companies are B2B and going after very large enterprises. And it's a very similar motion. Wow. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, um, this is like irrelevant to that kind of, um, one of the things you mentioned that like, you know, when you are sourcing deals, you will find, let's say, industry vet rents, right? Like you mentioned about Apple, Samsara, uh, maybe NVIDIA, I don't remember. So mm -hmm. you mentioned some tech company in general. Do they have to have industry experience in um, manufacturing in the traditional sense? Or it's better that they just don't come from that background? It's a really good question, actually. Um, and we have both experience. We have ex experience of someone that works in Boeing and he left to do another company in the aviation space and he actually was very successful. And we also have the other experience of someone that left uh, uh, Amazon that you can, you can call a tech company, but he was an Amazon robotics dealing with the logistics. So I will call it actually, he dealt with the uh, hardware and full stack uh, that left and was very, very successful as well. Um, what I think we always uh, looking back to is these people are solving something that is differentiated 
and is this team is unique it's like the, the little AL here yeah. uh, and is the and, and is uh, is um is this team are uniquely qualified to the problem that they are solving and do we believe they're going to get lucky meaning there is an inflection point in the industry that they are trying to solve i will say we have a very good experience with people that came from tech background in a companies that touching physical industries spacex on space, NVIDIA, on semiconductor, Amazon and logistics and robotics, Samsara and industrial IoT, et cetera. Mm. Um, I'm taking notes. Um, yeah. Are they supposed to be, let's say, the VP of engineering of these companies or like what level of e like experience should they have to build something meaningful? They don't need to be the most senior people in the companies in order to come with differentiated strategies and build an amazing company. Um, we have an experience again with people that were very senior, but also we had an experience with people that was like a director of engineering or director of product and come up with a, an amazing company. So uh, I can't say that it's, we only um, require them to be very senior in those companies in order to build amazing businesses. How do you build the network in these companies? So one of the things is my partners at Eclipse came from those uh, companies. So uh, Greg came from Tesla and Charlie and G10 from Rivian and Aiden from Samsara and Mark from Apple and Seth from GE and Caitlin from Flexport. Um, so um, we, Jose, uh, have a very good network in those companies because we were operators in a lot of cases in those companies before and people know what we do well so um they, they, they want to come and build with us businesses i guess how do you stay fresh with the talent pool because since they've been in venture i'm sure like you know you can constantly hearing everything from the maybe like Maybe people will have like an employee who left X company, WhatsApp group or something. But like beyond that, like how do you kind of actively sourcing deals? Because I think knowing the 2000 people at a big company is one thing, you know, being on top of the game to figure out who is the top player in that a specific sector, hearing about they are building a company, being able to chat with them at the first minute convince them to build a meaningful company and take your money also quickly do due diligence in a particular industry that's like a million jobs there like i wonder how do you kind of navigate that yeah it's an old yeah yeah it's an old good hustle um we even if we were very senior people in tesla as you say the people are change over the years and kind of like how you keep your uh, being a top of mind of the people that now working in Tesla or SpaceX or whatever is the company. And the two things that uh, we are focusing our time at Eclipse, and there is only two goals, is see all deals and build to last. We don't need to do all of the deals, but we better see all of the deals in our space. And that's, that's true. The insane amount of work that we are doing on building our networks, refreshing our networks, being top of mind of our differentiation and skills. And build to last is once we find that amazing company and in investing, we want to help the team with our operating experience to build companies that will be enduring and transforming those industries. That's the only two goals that we have at the firm. And that's the only two things I measure the team. Um, and it's a constant 24-7, 365 hustle like crazy in order to sell deals. What are some, what is like a white space in this industry when you're thinking about it most of those industries is being around for many hundreds of years right construction logistics manufacturing um what we find that is really exciting is we can take the most cutting edge technology let's take a foundational model of artificial intelligence the most cutting edge what silicon valley is only talk about and apply it in the physical industry and this combination between this most cutting edge robotics and foundational models or the most uh, um, uh, generative AI and, and mechanical design, the combination is the magic because the, um, you use some of the most amazing 
uh, technologies that the world is giving us in an industry that is being around for a long time and it needs to change. And from time to time, when you hit it right, there is this magic that's happening. And you're able to build the companies that uh, will be here for a long time and will be some of the most transformative companies in the world. Do you think AI first or do you think about how industry function first? Like what does the diligence process look look like for you? Um, yeah, when you it's, always, it, it's always the latter. We actually don't think about the technology. <laughs> that sounds funny <laughs> because we're investing in the most cutting edge technologies in the world. We always think about the market. What is the market? How big is the market? If, do we believe there is an inflection point in this market? Who is the largest companies in the market? What is the go-to market uh, motions going to be? And then we are talking about the technology. Can you give us an example of how you research a particular market? We can use the company you just visit as example. Um, how does a market work traditionally? And how big is the market? And how do you identify inflection point? And what's your go-to-market motion look like? Yeah, so it, it's um, all enterprise uh, sell, lend and expand usually in our case. It's a very, uh, it's actually a really good uh, and important point. This is not your traditional SaaS 20K ACV that uh, you're using SDRs and things like that. This is contract that some of them will be, the program contract can be a billion dollars over 10 years. Now it's very, it looks very different than traditional uh, SaaS because you might start with the qualification of the parts, then you will start with the certification, then you will start with low production and you will in year three ramp to $100 million a year and it will continue to ramp. So you might actually sign, if you're successful with some of those customers, a billion dollar program. Now it takes many years to get that company to, because it's those very large Fortune 500 companies, they're very risk reverse to actually be able to give you the, the contract and the program of record. And you will need to pass a lot of qualification and testing and site visits and ISO certification. And you need to manufacture a lot of those parts and they will do third party measurements of the parts around the quality of the parts and pricing and negotiation. This is like a 24, 24 months sales process. But if you're successful, you can sign um, an enormous type of contracts, enormous. Um, and the majority of the things we can help is we know those markets really well. We know the customers really well. We have the ability to call to their C-suite and understand the most pain point. Uh, they also trust our uh, reputation when we're bringing them a company because we don't represent one company, we represent 50 companies. And each of those Fortune 500 can walk with 20, 30 of them. So it's worthwhile for them to build a relationship uh, with us. Um, but yes, it's, uh, I think um, we, our goal is to teach Silicon Valley in the next couple of years, what is this program of records mean in regards to sales, in, in regards to venture backed companies? Because, you know, SaaS metrics, everyone knows SaaS metrics, not everyone know this program of records um, that uh, a lot of our companies are facing and signing with. What is, can you unpack that a little bit, like the program of records? Yeah, so um, let's take, um, you are a medical device company and you are buying metal parts uh, from a bunch of vendors. And let's say that uh, you spend every year um, four or $500 million of buying metal parts and integrate those metal parts into your uh, uh, product. Now we are creating a new company that can manufacture very high-end metal parts and we can do it in a way that nobody can do it today. And you as the customer, you actually like it. And we start spending time with each other and I'm start uh, showing you the technologies, I'm hosting you in our factory, I'm showing you the IP that we build. And I will win usually a small contract with you to test if, I can actually become one of your main vendors of those metal parts. And I will start shipping you those parts and you will qualify them. I will start to integrate to your system, et cetera. Um, and then the goal in the end of those qualification and think about it as like almost like a dating of you feeling comfortable with me as a qualifying vendor for you. Then, then the end of that, the goal will be of you signing with me a production 
contract that usually will be five to 10 years of me producing you X amount of parts every year uh, to the spec. And this is very lucrative type of a deals because I now have five to 10 years forecast of revenue. Assuming I meeting the quality uh, that I commit to the price, the SLA, basically the, the, what we agree on, on the, on the contract. And a lot of our companies today are signing three, four, five, ten 10 years contracts uh, with their customers because the pain to get in those customers is very high. But once you're in, they don't like to switch. Mm. Do you have a sales playbook for that? We do. <laughs> um, we definitely have a very good idea how to. And the interesting part, regardless if it's uh, metal parts or pharma manufacturing or energy storage, the playbook is very, very similar. Very similar. I would say it's the good 85-15, not even 80-20. Uh, and we are bringing that playbook to our companies and we're helping them building that motion internally, hiring the right people, etc. Mm. On a high level, what does that look like? You don't have to go into detail if it's like a confidential information. No, it's not. Uh, we, I think we actually published that. Uh, and Caitlin, uh, my partner uh, that did it for Flexport, she, she's much better than me of, of teaching others how to do it. But it's um, account executive usually. Um, so you have account executive that will be your sales team that will work with few of uh, potential accounts on qualifying your technology. It's usually this uh, 18 to 24 months sales cycle. You might close a smaller deal before. By the way, smaller deals to our companies, it's a few million dollars. So, you know, if you're looking on the enterprise software or the fintech, a few million dollars is unheard. Mm -hmm. Usually ACV will be 100K at best. Um, that would be a small deal of qualification. And once you get that deal, and let's say you're selling them um, um, automation for warehouses, you're in the warehouse automation space, you, you will sign with them a first warehouse as a pilot. Then there is an SLA. They will want to see that you can do this uptime with this uh, unit per hours, with this uh, amount of intervention uh, by... Uh, people, you basically will agree with them on the KPIs that that pilot needs to be. And if you are meeting that pilot, they will give you $30, $40 million deal immediately to put it in another five, six warehouses. And if you are doing that, you will continue to expand till you sign with them usually a global master deal that they will roll you across the logistics warehouse in that case. Mm. I guess, how do you even hire these account executives for different industries? It's, uh, we spend a lot of time on that point, and we have a network of uh, a lot of those account executives and VP sales, and we have a very good idea who you should hire in the seed Series A, Series B, and who you should hire in the Series C, Series D. It's usually actually different people. Um, it, then the people that do the lend and the people that do the expand are usually not the same people. You have account executive and account managers that actually it's, think about it, the hunters and farmers type of a thing. Um, but yeah, we, we spend a lot of time of building a network of uh, these people because um, surprisingly to what people think, although we build automation for warehouses, metal parts, manufacturing and batteries, the companies never failed on the technology. <laughs> They mm -hmm. always fail on the go-to market and be able to transform how those industries are using technology. So in that very fine engagement and the ability to influence the customers to use very cutting-edge technologies, this is, this is where we spend most of our time. Mm. As an investor, um, I don't know how comfortable you are talking about like yeah. fund construction or you know, all that kind of stuff. So eventually you're in the business of um, finance to a degree. So like, I wonder, mm -hmm. how do you think about fund construction on a high level? And you mentioned about like, you guys want to invest in companies that transform an industry from a full stack perspective. How do you manage your time and energy on study each category of things? 
to become an expert and identify which company has the best market or easier to go to market kind of thing. Yeah, I will start uh, from the second question. I will go then to the first. We only we hire to Eclipse only operators that operate in those industries, meaning we, on our own skin, uh, operate and know the innovation in those markets. And now we are transform transforming to become also investors, not only builders, but we leverage a lot uh, um, every day, our operating chops to research those markets, finding the cracks and the opportunities, finding those companies, investing in them, and then helping them build those businesses. Um, and for us, what it works, because our three principles, it's high conviction, high ownership, high involvement, is to bring amazing operators that being very successful operators in those industries and teach them how to also be investors. That's what works for us. Uh, fund construction. So today we are in the typical 10 plus two uh, fund construction. And um, we are a firm that is highly driven by DPI and thinking about DPI all the time. Uh, um, although I talked about building enduring businesses, what I measure the team is like how much money we returns to the LPs because uh, as I mentioned, we raise money from um, non-profit organization and we are very much care about the mission on it, and each of them and what's going to matter in the end of the day is the DPI. So it's a, every Monday we are talking about that and thinking about uh, how, it's, how we are going to impact the, the performance of those films. I think there is something to be said that if you find an asset, if you build a company that can really be enduring for 20, 30 years, is this is make sense to enforce um, liquid your position because you are in the end of life uh, of that particular company. We didn't, we start about eight years ago. So almost eight and almost nine now. Um, so we, we, we are not yet into this phase of feeling that, but it's something I'm thinking quite a lot. Mm. Um, and I do believe, um, in an extremely humble way, there is an opportunity to create a Brickshire Hathaway, uh, for venture, um, of, you know, bunch of holding businesses that operate physical industries that, that Brickshire do the best, but coming from the early stage, um, that will require the different type of a fund structure, but uh, I'm not there yet. We have a lot to prove before we can uh, think about changing the fund construction. For people who are investing in, so like basically, are you saying you would invest in a company at a very, very early stage and then you mentioned like you invest in a company that you invest, you lead four rounds of capital for that company. Mm -hmm. So basically, do you collaborate with people who invest in them earlier in the space or you have to be the first person to discover them? You know, as you mentioned, like you want to see every deal, like uh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of approach. Yeah, we, we actually stage agnostics. We have the ability to build companies by ourselves. It's about one third of what we do. Um, then we usually um, will lead seed series A's and we have the ability also to come in series B and series C and lead around. We actually have uh, a stage agnostic approach. The only thing is we only lead, but uh, that's the, um, or, or happy to call it if, if, if it makes sense. But uh, our model, it goes back to the three principles, high conviction. We get the conviction through being an operators in those industries, high ownership, because we do few deals every year, so we can be high involved. So I can bring my operating experience to those companies. Now I cannot bring my operating experience to 500 companies. I can, nobody at the firm can do more than 10 companies. And currently we have 50 and we are 10 uh, our partners. So we have 50 more to go or if, you know, IPO some of them and exit some of them. And unfortunately some of them will not make it. But um, our principles are very much connect to I think our ability to create an alpha, we can actually spend the time with each of those companies and helping them build enduring businesses. Uh, um, but uh, goes back to your original questions, we can build a company, we can do the C, we can do the A, we can do the B, we can do the C, um, as long as we have a high conviction. I, uh, how, like, how much ownership do you typically target? 
we have we be very high ownership on traditional ventures. So we are targeting um, around 25% in the initial check. And then we hope to build our position uh, to 35 and we own some 40 percent in some of our companies and we're happy to write 200 million dollar for it over the lifetime of the company um the reality is the company is going to give that ownership anyhow now the question is like how many partners you're giving those uh this ownership to uh on any of our 50 companies we have other co-investors so we it's not like we must be alone uh, we usually collaborate with others but uh we have in order for me to give you the my high involvement and everything that we talked about today on the relationships and the go-to-market knowledge and those customers, in order to do my to do my job to my LPs, I need the ownership. Because I don't have scout funds, I don't do spray and pray, I don't do small checks, I don't, uh, you know, uh, writing a uh, hundred checks every year. I'm writing eight, nine. Mm. In your opinion, do you feel like this strategy only approach uh, only like apply to industrial innovation type of companies or do you feel like it's also should be working in every other industry historically if you're looking on the best performing films in the world from sequoia to Sutter hill now in the infrastructure world they all have high ownership actually you cannot create a successful strategy or i'm not talking about the 20 million dollar fund if you are raising you know a substantial of fund, it's actually never work if you don't have iron ownership. And naturally, mm -hmm. those people investing outside of industrial, right? Um, so I think it's uh, that's relevant to any industry that you operate. I wonder when you are, you know, early on, we we're talking about like from sourcing to picking to winning to you know liquidate um do you feel like 50 percent of the game is like you source the best founder or like do you feel like it's only 25 percent of the game so it sounds like you know you have to source from like the industry industrial expert let's say if there's like a director of apple um there's two directors mm -hmm. of apple they're leaving their team to build a company in the same in a sim or adjacent sector, which yeah. how do you identify like who to pick? What's your picking strategy? Or like, do you feel like picking is not very important because of they kind of both have like the amazing background? But like uh, uh, in the other way, like every year there's like a billion people living leaving these companies. How do you kind of like evaluate who is actually going to make it? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually picking. It's an at the peak you usually will determine the potential outcome of that company. So picking is actually incre incredibly important. And we have our own scorecard of personalities that we are doing and analyzing um, when we are doing uh, that picking of, of the founders. And, you know, we have maybe a little bit advantage as being an operators. We hired a lot of people into those companies. So we actually have a pretty interesting taste of the type of the people we believe can build uh, massive industries, uh, digital transform uh, type of the companies. Um, but it goes back to, they need to have differentiated strategy. They need to be uniquely qualified on that strategy. And it's almost never, oh, there are these brilliant PhDs and they come up with a new formula of doing something. We don't invest in science projects. We invest in a company that can be very fast, big commercial uh, success. And that means that these people need to have a combination of um, extremely smart, uh, workaholic, uh, extremely uh, big vision, but also humble to listen to the customer and understand which product you need to build, not knowing Oh yeah, I came from Apple, so everyone is going to listen. When you leave Apple, you are not an Apple anymore, and you uh, the doors that is being opened so easily bef before are not going to be easily open again. Uh, your reputation will help, but it's a different business, and we are looking on this very unique uh, combination of personalities that we think are make uh, really good founders for us. What questions 
would you ask them to figure out if they have the big, fast, big commercial success potential? Now like, you're asking me about about that, about the, the secrets also of, uh, of what we do. I uh, will give you some of them. Uh, yeah, you know, it's um, we spend a lot of time with, with these people, although we are high conviction and we don't do crypto, fintech, SaaS and industrial. We do only industrial markets. So we know the market really well and we are tech people. So we know the technology really well. So we're actually we're going to spend most of the time on the people themselves. And, you know, I find that uh, yeah, I'll give you a, um, a question that I love to ask and kind of, uh, it's, it's always interesting to hear the stories. Like, wh what are you scared of? And there is people that will tell you, ah, oh, I don't care about anything. Like I'm this big shot from whatever company, I'm going to walk in the park here, uh, building a company that for me would be a very huge turn off. Um, uh, I would ask them what they are looking on the DNA of the people they want to hire. And based on that question, uh, based on that answers, I will build a lot of my conviction around the personality. Uh, I will, will, will focus a lot of us, but what is the principles of the company that you want to build? Well, what is the things that you will not be, um, that will be like a red line for you? Um, we have a list of a um, bunch of those questions that we will ask and that will score those, uh, um, the, the, the personalities and they might, we might be wrong and they might turn to build an amazing companies and we'll try to, come in the later round and we were wrong and they were right. But in a lot of cases, we have a fairly good taste of what we are looking for and what will make successful founder to build a company in the intersection between technology and physical industries. I'm distracted by the question. What are you scared <laughs> of though? Oh, I scared about a lot of things. Um, I, it, it depends on, on which aspects, but uh, I, it's just incredible incredibly hard to build a huge business and an industry that is being doing the same things for some of them 100 years. You are coming and you are changing the way that they operate their industries with a new technology. You're telling them, hey, the rocket is going to take off and land in the same place. And they are like, yeah, right. And then you need to go and execute. And they were like, holy shit, um, you just transform this industry. And that's a magic. Um, and I'm scared about that because we we raised multiple of billions of dollars from an organization that deal to my heart. And I'm going to work harder than anyone else in order to delivering an alpha to them, meaning I need to pick the right founders and helping them cross that chasm on the commercialization in order for them to be enduring businesses and then good things will happen. I don't know if you have a couple minutes. I will keep like a one real question and maybe one minute sure. if I wrong. Okay. One real question is like, there's industries like, you know, real estate or something that's like more fragmented plus um, traditional mindset driven. How do you identify what is an industry that's can have fast, big commercial success versus what is something that you would not touch? Yeah, we, we do, we built about 60 six zero investment thesis every year that we are going and researching bottom up and 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 from a macro view of an industries that we believe are ready for disruption in those physical markets uh, and we will research of why is that we will reach us which technology is being used we will reach uh, i'll give you an example e-commerce push the logistics market to transform because you change the way that you are delivering packages so we had multiple of thesis in the last uh, nine years that we invested based on 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 that investment thesis um but we we do we just do a lot of research internally and again as an operators we have a very good in to those markets so we we have a pretty good point of view of where we believe a disruption will happen on the flip side we are in a lot of cases finding that things are still in the research science phase and if it's in the science phase we will actually will wait to the science to pan out and move to the engineering and scale phase where we uh, like to interact. So if we feel it's still in the science phase, we actually will put in on hold and watch the science uh, hopefully break through to engineering when we will go and engage. Mm. Okay. Um, I have a one minute fire round for you. Please. 
What's your favorite book? Favorite book? Um, Just Sleep. I, I read it uh, again recently as a someone that's doing a lot of red eyes and uh, I, I laugh in my team. Um, we have this thing I say, you don't need to sleep a lot. You just need to sleep fast. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm in the sleep fast emotion. Uh, who made the biggest impact in your career? Uh, Pierre Lamond, uh, for sure, um, that uh, helped me start an eclipse and is being a major pain in the ass, but uh, also um, the most amazing person. He is in the age of 94, still coming to the office to give board updates. Um, who would you invite to your dinner party? To a dinner party, Elon Musk, 10 out of 10. Where can we find you outside of work? Outside of work, in the house that I'm right now sitting, uh, spending time with my daughters and my family. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Lior, for coming on the show today. Grace, thanks for having me. Let me quickly end the 